Hi everyone, welcome back to another session of 8 Pixel 360 Virtual Expo, the May series. So for today's session, we're joined again once again by David Strike together with guest Mark Crane. So before we begin, let me quickly introduce the two of them. So David Strike is a former instructor trainer and certifier with a background in military, commercial, recreational and technical diving. David has authored several hundred dive-related articles. The ADEX Ambassador for Technical Diving, he is a recipient for the ADEX Lifetime Achievement Award and a fellow of the Explorers Club of New York. Our guest today, Mark, is an advanced Trimix rebreather instructor trainer, wreck and cave diver, chief diving safety officer for unseen expeditions, and a deep reef researcher. So now I'll pass it over to David to begin this fantastic session. The floor is yours, David. Thank you. Rishi, thank you very much. And uh, lovely to see you again. Yeah. Um, so, Mark, welcome. It's, um, it's been three, well, just over three years now since we last uh, caught up in the flesh. Absolutely correct. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, many thanks for the invitation, Mr. Strike. Uh, absolute privilege and an honour. Shame it's uh, a <laughs> shame, shame it's going, uh, you know, uh, with the usual kind of what we come used to Zoom platform now. Uh, but yeah, it has been about three years since the last time we caught up in Singapore. Uh, but yeah. looking, looking forward to remedying that uh, this September, sir. Yeah, so that'll be three and a half years. It seems like only yesterday, actually, but uh, it'll be so good to see live shows again and the, the appropriate sort of networking. Absolutely. But Mark, let's, let's, um, let me start off. Where do you come from, Mark? Um, oh, okay, yeah. Originally, I'm actually, for, I hail from the south coast uh, of the UK. I'm from sunny, sunny Bournemouth, uh, if anybody uh, is familiar with that. Uh, so it's like the south coast of the UK, uh, slap bang uh, on the uh, on the ocean front in the middle. Um, yeah, so that's where I come from. Uh, and you're now living in Bali, of course. And now I'm living in Bali, exactly. Yes. How long have you been in Bali for? Uh, Bali now has been since 2013, Indonesia. Oh, right. Indonesia in total uh, is since 2010 now. Right. Uh, so uh, quite some years. Quite some years, exactly. You're firmly entrenched there. But firmly, let, firmly let's entrenched. just get back to how you start. How did you get into diving? Uh, what, what first attracted you? What, what first attracted to me, actually, is something that uh, it's, it's probably my dad's fault. Well, not really his fault, uh, bless him. Uh, but uh, it was that time of the uh, year when uh, at, uh, at school in the UK, you're supposed to go out for work experience. So I came back and I said, uh, I need to find a work experience placement. These are the kind of, you know, going things that school recommends. Uh, and my dad, who was at the time um, doing uh, engineering consulting for a commercial diving uh, centre, uh, from well, commercial diving school from the uh, south coast of the UK, uh, said, no, you're not going to go and uh, work in an office somewhere. You're going to go and join the divers. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I was then like, right, OK, uh, yeah, that sounds interesting. This will be fun. Um, and I was kind of shipped off. It was two weeks before the end of term. Uh, our year then got to uh, leave, leave for the holidays a little bit early to go on a work experience placement. Uh, and I then basically spent uh, two glorious weeks in July in Poole, uh, uh, which is a, it's a lovely part of the UK. Uh, some very good diving. Yeah. Um, working on a barge, dredging a marina uh, uh, and seeing the guys go in and do sort of like underwater site inspection on a daily basis, never getting a chance to give it a go. Uh, becoming very, very good at making cups of tea, bacon sandwiches, uh, and just uh, getting covered in mud and all kinds of, you know, dredging remains. Where my mum, uh, when I got back in the evening, where my mum sort of like hosed me down in the garden for <laughs> into the house. Uh, and it was like the uh, final Friday of the two-week session before we could really actually start our summer holidays. Um, and I finally managed to sort of like, you know, beg and wind my way into getting a, a try on scuba. So I was kind of slipped into a, a dry suit, which was probably about four sizes too big for me, uh, at least. Uh, they gave me a mask, a lot of weight, uh, a, uh, like a rucksack um, a harness uh, with a steel Sam cylinder. Sam Brown harness. Yeah. yeah, exactly, with a steel cylinder on there. Uh, I wasn't given fins. They were far too technical. Uh, and I was, given, uh, I was given a bit of rope that was tied around the waist. Uh, 
uh, and I was given three very simple instructions. One pull is question you okay, two pulls is stop, and three pulls or more is come back. On your way down, you're probably going to feel some discomfort in your ears. You need to then squeeze uh, and equalize. There you go. Questions? Me? No, no questions. And I was just basically pushed overboard. Uh, went hurtling then down, uh, and I kind of sort of bottomed out in something that probably had kind of clarity of Bovril. Uh, you can imagine, you know, a visibility uh, after two weeks of dredging a marina. Uh, visibility wasn't exactly, you know. I was going to say, this was not sort of the... Uh an area where it's full of pretty fish and good visibility. No, 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 no not at all. Uh, like, sort of like, uh, stood up and just saw bubbles kind of passing my mask, heading for the surface, and I went, this is amazing. I love this. <laughs> uh, and kind of, uh, you know, felt my way around, uh, you know, uh, along the sea floor, up against sort of like girders. Uh, and I had this really clever idea, as you do, uh, to try and walk over um, to the um, amphibious landing base uh, from the uh, Royal Marine uh, base that is there in, <laughs> ah. in, in, in Hamworthy. Uh, of course, uh, you know, air bubbles are going up to the surface. And there's a couple of the lads, uh, uh, you know, uh, from, the, from the crew who uh, are also ex-forces. And they go, like, those bubbles, he's not, he's not heading over there, is he? Uh, obviously, I kind of got the idea that I did want to head over in the kind of general direction. Uh, and I felt these rope commands coming through with, am I OK? Yep, I'm OK. Can you stop? Uh, can you come back? And I'm like, no, 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 it's all good. It's all good. So I was then basically uh, pulled back like a, like a fish on a hook. I ended up back on, uh, on the deck of the boat. Uh, wondering what actually just happened with three guys basically sort of like asking me if I'm completely insane and waiting until my dad hears about this. Uh, and that was my first worry into diving. <laughs> well, it's probably just as well you didn't make it across to the Royal Marine Base. It's, uh, yeah. So, so you're still at school at this stage. Still at school at this stage, yes, exactly. Uh, and then I was uh, really kind of addicted. Uh, and then I basically spent most weekends, school holidays, uh, helping out jobbing, uh, you know, uh, at this uh, at the dive company. It was also uh, a commercial diving training centre. Uh, you know, we had recompression chambers there. There was uh, HSC courses going on for uh, the various levels uh, of commercial diving qualification. Uh, and I got then to uh, have some experience and play around as well uh, on these kind of uh, familiarisation uh, or uh, introduction courses um, using, you know, uh, Superlight 17s, uh, Kirby Morgan 27s, uh, had a go at a rat hat. I can't even remember what that's called. That was, that was a horrible bit of equipment. Uh, uh, and was actually then looking at going into a career in commercial diving. was thinking about uh, heading off to Plymouth. Uh, to uh, Bobbitt uh, and also to go to Plymouth Uni to do marine studies uh, and underwater technologies as a uh, Bachelor of Science degree. Went on a gap year, still on the gap. Sorry, year. just I'm just going back a bit. So, um, what happened to uh, Bovisand actually sort of conducted like like a university degree course or yeah 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 exactly well uh, in in partnership with the uh, University of Plymouth uh, so the University right. of Plymouth was with the was the first um, university in the UK to bring on uh, underwater technology and marine studies as a bachelor of science degree right. uh, back in 1992 uh, I think there's a few other universities offering that now, but uh, it was it was Plymouth that were pioneering that. And, uh, and Bobby Sands only just closed, just yeah. recently closed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a great. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So right. sorry, I was I was interrupted. So this, you're now on your gap year instead yes. of heading off there. You've got a gap year. What did you do? Uh, gap year I went became a dive master trainee in Kenya. Uh, well, that's the grew... sort of thing that most you know, young kids would do. Yeah, exactly. But I'm still on. Why the Kenya? Um, actually, it was just one of those kind of random things. Uh, I was uh, one of the guys that actually worked at the commercial uh, dive center. 
Uh, he'd gone out there to pursue a career in operations management uh, for a for, for a, a recreational scuba company. And he came back and he was uh, visiting the fam. Oh well, uh, visiting the family. And we caught up for a beer. Uh, well, he called up for a beer with my dad, uh, and I then kind of went. Um, Listen, you know, uh, I've, I've finished college. Uh, I like my diving. I've got my my diving, uh, my basic diving qualifications, which I did with the BZAC in the UK, you know, proper club system. Um, I'm looking at going out on a gap year uh, before going back to uni. Uh, what's it look like? He gives us a job. Uh, and he goes, I forgot you speak German. Yes, you can start the day after tomorrow. Uh, a week later, I, I was then on a flight uh, headed for Mombasa. Uh, most interesting flight of my life. Why? Uh, Why? Uh, Sorry. Why the most interesting flight of your life? Well, you see, uh, flights for dive master trainees in the glamorous uh, recreational scuba industry—they're not usually up the front, and they're not usually with reputable uh, airlines. Uh, so I got—I got a free ticket with Blue Lagoon. Uh, which used to be the biggest diving tour operator in France. Uh, they were partnered up with the uh, with the dive centre uh, in Kenya that I was flying out to, and somehow my you know future employers had managed to secure a a gratis uh, flight ticket. Um, so I then uh, went from London Heathrow to Paris Charles de Gaulle with British Airways, which was awfully nice. Uh, to then sort of like uh, see this, it was an absolutely, uh, you know, tiny machine. It was from some French or Belgian charter uh, company. I can't even remember the name of the airline that it was supposed to be. We took off from Paris. We landed in Lyon uh, to collect some more divers. Uh, we then took off from Lyon, went over the Alps, landed in Rome to refuel. Then we uh, took off from Rome, jumped over the Med, landed in Cairo to refuel. Um, from Cairo, it was then on to uh, <laughs> on to Mombasa, uh, and it was just it was a horrendous flight. At that time, we could actually still smoke on uh, on flights, uh, and you know, with my new gain freedom, I thought I'd be really ultra cool. And at that time, still smoking, uh, I thought I'd grab one of these smoking seats. So I was then up against the window uh, with my reclining seat going up against one of the toilet blocks uh, with a rather large gentleman uh, in front of me who basically had his seat reclined for the entire, I think, <laughs> 20, 24 hour flight. Uh, and he was just chugging cigars. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was absolutely horrible. He didn't think to open the window. Oh, no, 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 no. That, that, that would have probably helped, especially going over the Alps. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that was, uh, that was, that was, that was stupid. So, sorry, so you're, you're in Kenya. As, yep. uh, so how long were you there for? My gap, my, my original gap year turned into five years. Uh, because really, yes, yes, uh, it's actually unknown. Uh, Kenya's actually got some fantastic diving, uh, some very, very good right. diving. Uh, lots of good wildlife. Uh, it's very, very good with uh, whale sharks. Actually, the WWF have got a whale shark program running there uh, because uh, whale sharks they seem to congregate uh, in the uh, you know uh, off the Kenyan coast in January, uh, yeah, December, January. Uh, and this was something that was just uh, basically it it went crazy after the 1998 El Nino. I, mean, I remember running tours there when we, uh, we were driving back uh, from the marine park and we'd see sort of like, you know, 15, 20 whale sharks. Wow. Uh, so, hey, what, um, so, sorry, you were qualified. You'd obviously, what, uh, what ratings did you have? Which agency? Well, I had a, uh, I had a BZ export diver or the SAA version of it, uh, the SAA right. Subacra Association, even smaller than BZ. Uh, Read the read the BZAC manual uh, as part of the course, uh, and yeah, that I had sort of like first aid, basic boat handling, BHF uh, radio, you know, the kind of stuff that you do back in the club uh, in the UK. Uh, and I arrived then in Kenya, and it was all uh, very much on the, uh, uh, the the American recreational market. So I had my tickets then uh, over to Rescue Diver, crossed over very very quickly. 
uh, and I was then going out learning the dive sites and uh, learning how to uh, guide groups of uh, recreation right. then properly. Uh, and that was the whole sort of like that dive master training experience. So you were a dive master all the time that you were there? Uh, that was the first year. Uh, right. And then, uh, you know, so my, my gap year was coming then to an end. Uh, I was uh, very much uh, in love with the, uh, with the destination. I was really very, uh, very passionate about the diving, was getting more into the diving. Uh, so the uh, next step was obviously to you know, break my mum's heart and say, I'm not going to university. I'm now going to career, uh, uh, pursue a career in professional sport diving. Uh, and become a scuba instructor. Um, and I did. Uh, and I was actually scheduled to go back and uh, do oh, an no. It's <laughs> like, that's the equivalent of saying, you know, just to cheer her up, you told her you were going to play piano in a brothel or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, 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 exactly, exactly. So I was scheduled then to go back home to the UK where I was going, uh, I'd already signed up for an IBC uh, with Steve Axel down in Broccoli. Uh, Rocky, uh, Rocky Park, uh, which is just down the road from where I was actually living. Uh, and the company said, hey, they're starting a uh, they're starting an instructor program here with this uh, other agency. Uh, why don't you stay instead of doing it now in the UK in a dry suit and in the gold? Why don't you just stay here and do it in the sun? And I was like, right. Yeah, OK. And so in June 1996, uh, I became uh, an SSI instructor. Right. Uh, so like in the first group of, uh, well, the, the, the first uh, IDC group that was run for SSI in East Africa. Uh, was, uh, so obviously it, you're doing sort of this, this is all open circuit air. Yeah. It's all, it's all open circuit air. So it's definitely uh, very much within the sort of like, you know, sport diving, single cylinder recreational range. Yeah. Uh, um, in 98, we then did move into Nitrox. We put in the first uh, uh, Nitrox uh, blending system in East Africa. Uh, uh, we commissioned that. And of course, for us instructors, that was then great because now we've actually got a gas that will allow us to decompress better after deep air diving, because of course we all get into that at some stage or back then we did. Uh, and that was sort of like, you know, the, the first moves into technical diving. Uh, I was also keeping in contact with friends and the developments uh, uh, back in the UK uh, and, you know, also going returning every year, going home, uh, keeping an eye on, you know, the development of technical diving, especially closed circuit rebreathers. Uh, and actually, uh, I've just recently uh, found the original uh, flyer from the, uh, from the inspiration. <laughs> the the inspiration, right. inspiration classic uh, rebreather, which I think was banged out on the AP valves office photocopier and then folded by the intern because uh, it's all black and white and it's about this revolutionary yeah. new bit of diving equipment. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, just basically um, keeping an eye out on that, uh, probably diving a little bit deeper than you should do on air uh, out in East Africa, uh, using my trucks then to uh, accelerate decompression, trying to work this out by, you know, what you'd seen on the internet, cutting tables, uh, following, following your dive computer, um, and, and, you know, trying to get uh, information um, and stay updated. Uh, and I just, Where, uh, whereabouts were you getting sort of a lot of information from? Because now we take for granted the, the internet and, and the various forums. And... Yeah, exactly. I mean, there the internet was, uh, it, it, we didn't really have the internet back then. It was sort of like yeah. uh, magazine, uh, magazines, uh, guests to be bringing manuals in. Uh, you, you know somebody that knew somebody could then can fax over facts uh, <laughs> yes. uh, uh, facts over sort of like uh, I've, I've banged this out on my decompression software maybe you want to actually have a look how you could run this uh, you know uh, tying bits of chandlery equipment together to try and make right. the kit work etc uh, yeah that's, that's what we're doing uh, so how long did you stay so after Kenya what, what did you do so sorry, you're, you're now a, an instructor. You're now a night trucks instructor. Yeah. Where did you go uh, from there? Uh, then I went to Mexico. 
Right. Well, that's an obvious move from Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why? Why uh, Mexico? I had the opportunity uh, to. Uh, I had the actually. I was. Uh, I was invited out on a job gig. Uh, so one of the uh, hotels that I'd worked for in Kenya, the uh, hotel manager, he was going out and managing a resort out there, where the dive center was kind of affiliated in the resort. Um, and he said, listen, I know uh, you're starting to have enough of it in, uh, in Kenya. Uh, there's the opportunity for you to come over here to Mexico. Uh, and I went, oh, yep, okay, I like the idea of that. And I went over, uh, obviously, with a, with a cave diving uh, idea in the background. Uh, you hadn't done cave diving at this point? No, I hadn't done any cave diving. Right. Uh, you know, again, you'd seen all the magazines and you'd heard people talk yeah. about it. Uh, and I was like, yes, okay, I, I really want to do this. Um, so I, I left Kenya <coughs> uh, and uh, ended up uh, in Mexico just after the 9-11 attacks, uh, uh -huh. which obviously had kind of decimated tourism. Uh, there weren't really yeah. a lot of, not, not really a lot of flights going on. So it was like a three-day working week, uh, which, was, which was great because it just gave you actually more time to go cave diving. Uh, so I got qualified, uh, 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 you know, as a full cave diver, and then you know, with my colleagues. Where did you do that? I did that with a independent instructor uh, who was working out of a place just north of Tulum, right. where I was also actually operating, actually in between Tulum and Playa del Carmen. Uh, uh, that's where that's where the dive center was. So how many, how much cave diving did you then do there? Uh, well, unfortunately, I mean, due to the uh, issue with tourism uh, directly after 9-11, there wasn't really a lot of work going. I managed to actually right. kind of ho hold on in Mexico uh, for about nearly a year, uh, which were, was a, a lot of fun cave diving with the rest of the instructors uh, uh, from the dive shop. We were all basically, you know, looking at each other. There weren't really a lot of guests. Um, uh, and on work rotations, sort of like you know, two, three day weeks. Uh, so uh, the other thing as well is if you're right there on Yucatan, uh, you're, you're basically living in Mexican cave country. Uh, so you finish work, you can then load the company pickup and just drive a, uh, drive opposite yeah. uh, across the road. Uh, and what, and so what, what were you using? What what equipment? You were still using sort of air at this stage? Yeah, no, I mean, at that time. Circuit air? Yeah, at that time it was uh, primarily air uh, twins. Yeah. Right. Uh, one of my colleagues, he was actually then starting to go, oh, well, you know, they're, they're talking about this side mount thing. Let's give this side mount thing a go. Uh, and so, like, the, uh, the early uh, moves into side mount in Mexico. Um, but it was, it was basically doubles, twin sets, you know? yeah. uh, and air. Uh, it's not super deep. Well, a lot of the cave stuff in Mexico is not super deep. Uh, so you actually get fairly good run times on air. Uh, and that's what we were doing. Uh, but all, all, all good things have to come to an end. Uh, and unfortunately, just because of the whole sort of like economical pressure uh, with tourism being so affected, um, I was kind of let go because the last one in is the first yeah. one out. Uh, uh, and uh, my colleagues uh, at the dive center there, they were much more firmly established in Mexico. They'd been there for a few years. They weren't really going anywhere. Um, so I left uh, and I had then the opportunity to go out and work with some friends in the Egyptian Red Sea, uh, which I then did. Uh, and that's really where I finally got a chance to get into, uh, into closed circuit rebreathers. Right. How, how did that come about? Uh, that came about by finally actually having finally actually having enough money uh, to buy one second hand. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you buy? Uh, I bought an inspiration uh, because I mean back in 2002 there wasn't really a, a massive choice uh, of mainstream uh, of production yeah. models uh, available and I actually uh, I just found, I found it. I was back out in the Red Sea here in January. Uh, and I found my original inspiration. Uh, it was still nicely locked up in a box. Uh, it's a 1997 model. It was actually the uh, 
the inspiration that Max Hahn was using on his fateful last dive. Uh, uh, it served me very, very well. Uh, and I got to cut my teeth in, uh, uh, in rebreather diving, so to speak, uh, on that unit. <laughs> Uh, Do you, um, sorry, who was, so there were courses being run there in the Red Sea on the... There were, there were courses yeah. being run there. I mean, the uh, dive centre I then went out and uh, started working for, it's a German operation. Um, they had already, uh, because of the, the company owner, the company owner was already uh, very into technical mixed gas diving open circuit, uh, did like, you know, the, the deeper side of it, the more technical side of things. That was his uh, own personal hobby and passion. Uh, and that kind of then got pushed through uh, into the sort of like dive center agenda as well. Um, we could see the limitations of open circuit helium uh, because of just because of gas bills, uh, yeah. as you're well aware of. Uh, and he already had adopted the uh, Draga Dolphin, uh, the semi-closed rebreather uh, pretty early back in 97, 98. Uh, and then around, around about 2001, uh, they started to be one of the first uh, dive centers in the Red Sea to offer uh, inspiration training. So when I got there and saw all of this, you know, uh, all of these rebreathers on the bench there, I was like, right, yeah, this is, this is definitely the place for me. Uh, I really want to be here. But I'd been given a job from the, uh, from the recreational perspective. So I was told to go back to the front of the shop, uh, not here to the, you know, hallowed, uh, hallowed halls in the back, uh, in the tech area. Uh, I'm a single tank diver. Go back and, oh, you know, really? go back and do, do that kind of thing. Uh, so, yeah, it started there again. Um, obviously, um, moved my qualifications then... Uh, into uh, open circuit decompression uh, instruction or uh, instructor rating. Uh, it did uh, open circuit normoxic instructor. This is still uh, with SSI or? No, this was actually then with INTD. Uh, right. With, uh, the, the, you know, the dive shop there in the Red Sea. Uh, when they went in with tech, they actually went in with, uh, with INTD, uh, right. the, the German affiliation. Um, run, run from the Germany office. Um, so I then uh, progressed through the open circuit stuff there and then finally managed to uh, scrimp and save together by the second hand unit. Uh, and then it was just basically getting qualified on it. Um, I'd actually already done the qualification. Uh, I've been, I've been fortunate enough to be allowed to join a course that the, the shop was running uh, on one of the shop units. Uh, but they then told me, if you now want to start thinking about instructing on this or teaching on this or getting any more experience on this, you're going to have to buy one. I was like, oh, 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 okay. Um, but yeah, I managed to then get that. And then it was just any kind of diving I could do. If I was guiding uh, recreational divers down to 20 meters, I'd be on the rebreather. Uh, if I was now looking after uh, a, a, you know, a boat going out to the dive sites, we're all... Or autonomous certified divers, I'd then be asking, you know, have dive buddies on the boat, and listen, can, I can I tag along with you? I need to get hours on me inspiration. Uh, so yeah. you're, you're now a rebreather diver. diver. Yeah. And you've, uh, you, you've learned and own the inspiration, but you've covered a deal of rebreathers, different uh, machines. You, you then got into uh, the Revo, well, yeah, I mean, uh, I first of all, I had to actually then get my uh, instructor rating uh, on the inspiration. So I got that all then uh, together. Uh, and then there was definitely a, a, a bigger shift, uh, both in the UK uh, and uh, European market in into rebreathers. Uh, so we're probably talking here around about uh, 2004, 2005. Uh, and you were getting more units now uh, coming out, being produced. Uh, they were they, they were no longer such a niche thing, uh, such an extreme rarity. Uh, and more people were now using rebreathers for you know uh, deep wreck dives, uh, 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 coral research, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and I was then actually in a position through the dive center that I was working for there in the Red Sea uh, to also be hosting quite a lot of people coming in, uh, either just building up hours, doing uh, fun experience, yeah. actually coming in uh, and doing courses. 
Uh, so, I mean, we had uh, the legendary Mr. Dave Thompson uh, of the JJ fame. He came down uh, with one of the uh, first generation JJs uh, teaching courses out of our shop. Um, I had, uh, I, I then also was seeing, I'd like to try something a little bit different. This is about the time where VR technologies uh, yeah, uh, were. Uh... Yeah, Kevin Gurr, where uh, Kevin was then actually uh, just about to release uh, the Sentinel rebreather. Uh, so I, I got on board with that actually very, very early. Uh, I think I got the uh, unit number 30 or 31. Uh, and uh, an Al Wright came out from the UK um, to, do, to, to run my course on that, uh, to run both my user and my instructor crossover then. Uh, so he was out for a couple of weeks. Uh, and we were just sort of like, you know, fun diving and getting to know the unit and playing with it. Um, and then in about 2007, uh, I kind of looked at all of the um, ECCRs, the electronically controlled closed circuit rebreathers on the market, and was pretty well covered with what I had. Uh, um, I, I was very happy there, but I wanted to get a little bit of an idea about the manual side of things, uh, actually become a manual closed circuit rebreather diver. Um, and through also being able to then through the shop uh, go and represent them at various dive shows, uh, trade shows uh, yeah. back in the UK and around Europe. Uh, I you know uh, got to meet, uh, well, got to see the uh, the Revo uh, at, a, at a few different dive shows, and I managed to convince the uh, designer and then owner of Revo Rebreathers to come over. Paul Raymakers. Paul Raymakers to come over. Yeah. Uh, so he came over actually with the uh, with the entire family, uh, and he said, "Yeah, no, we can we can sort something out. Then we can get you all trained up here on the unit. That's not a problem. You just keep the family entertained." Um, and uh, as luck would have it, or un, you know, misfortune would have it, at that time we'd also actually scheduled a photo shoot with Unterwasser, which is uh, one of the, the largest um, dive magazines in the in the German speaking part of the world. Uh, so they've got you know a big uh, audience in uh, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and we were doing a photo shoot shoot on a hundred meter wreck just north of Ogada. Uh, and when Paul was there, I was in scheduled to be the support diver and basically making sure that the uh, journalist and the photographer don't drown. Uh, and I was uh, told, "Listen, you're looking after those. We'll give two of the other members of your team the chance to learn the revo." And I was like. I've kind of worked, you know, 18 months to try and make this happen. Um, and now I've got to babysit the journalists. And it was like, yeah, uh, that's that's what happens. You know, I, my boss said, uh, I'm boss, you employee, I, uh, you get a paycheck, I pay you that paycheck. Uh, yes, it's the golden rule, isn't it? Exactly. He with the gold makes the rules. <laughs> exactly. And I was just like, hmm, okay, I can't argue with that. Um and I think actually uh, my dive centre manager and Paul, they kind of pitied me. So when we finished this, Paul had actually scheduled to do uh, fun diving for the family himself. And he said, listen, if you carry on, you know, looking after them and taking diving, we'll, uh, we'll get Mark qualified on this machine. Uh, and yeah, but just basically built a relationship with that rebreather uh, from then on. So what sort of depths were you? You're down uh, close to 300 metres here. <laughs> You were saying the wreck? Uh, no, no, no. It was a hundred meter wreck. 100 oh, meter sorry, a uh, hundred, uh, hundred meter wreck. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Right. You know, uh, at, at at this time, you know, we were basically diving very, very regularly to that hundred, yeah. one hundred and twenty meter range. I have to, I have to ask with the various free breathers that you're now uh, used to using. Yeah, have you ever? Did you ever get confused with the sort of the nuances between them? It's easy to do, actually. Yes, it is. It is, e it is easy to do when you're now actually chopping and changing. And that's why I also made a, uh, a firm decision a few years ago uh, to really now, I mean, I'm, I'm qualified to teach now, I believe, on around about six or seven machines, yeah. Um. Uh, if not a few more, uh, but I have basically given up my teaching status on uh, all of them bar three. Uh, and those are machines that I feel very, very confident and comfortable with. Right. Uh, uh, and therefore, 
Um, I live in a, a fantastic diving destination. Um, I think you've been to this part of the world yeah. here uh, before as yeah. well. Uh, I've got very, very easy diving uh, directly off my doorstep uh, and I can walk in off the beach. Uh, it's warm water, uh, which is also another nice thing. So I then do actually spend quite a lot of time on my different units practicing. Uh, the ones that okay. I've elected, I'm going to be, because I mean, fairly obviously, we're, we're limited in sort of time, but sure. I'm fascinated about the work that you're doing. So, just merely having a rebreather and going down and coming back up again is a, it's a bit pointless unless there's it's a mission oriented uh, sort of dive. So, you got into and are very closely involved a, a lot of, uh, well, for want of a better term, scientific diving, the research on deep reefs and tell me a little bit about and the one that fascinates me the most is the celia camps uh, yes that, that 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 elusive gem uh yeah uh, we, we've got part two of that coming up in october right uh tell we, me tell me all about it the celia and for the benefit of people that might not be familiar just you best just describe what a celia can is it, 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 it's a living fossil uh, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a dinosaur fish uh, that we thought had long gone extinct uh, until they, until fishermen dragged one up in, I think, I think the 30s in South Africa. Yeah. Uh, and then this part of the world, I mean, Indonesia, they found one back in the mid, uh, mid 90s, same kind of thing, fishermen uh, dug one up or pulled one up. Uh, it's not only about coelacanths. I mean, here coelacanths uh, around Bali uh, have never actually been confirmed. There's no evidence of that. Uh, but uh, I've been now involved with um, with a friend of mine, my colleague, um, uh, Alexis Chapuis, who you also know. Yes. Uh, he, you know, he's he's presented at ADEX before. Uh, Alexis is the brains of the operation. He's the uh, the science. Uh, he's he's the one also with all of the patients. Uh, I just basically put dive kit and dive plans together and uh, make sure he's on time and, and we leave the bottom when we're supposed to. Because uh, these I, are deep dwelling fish, aren't they? They are. Uh, Celia camps are a deep dwelling fish. I mean, uh, the top end of their range, what we believe now the top end of their range is, is sort of like around about 100 metres. Give or take twenty. Wow. Uh, they could they could come up as shallow as ninety, uh, but normally they're sort of like you know in a hundred and hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty meters of water and deeper. Right. And what they then like actually they like they they like reef structures that are that got you know nooks and crannies in there, so they like overhangs and caves and that kind of stuff. And you, you have all of those, that sort of diving sort of nearby or? We have similar kind of diving uh, nearby, but again, we haven't actually been uh, looking for that. Uh, we've been looking at um, the bump-headed uh, sunfish, uh, Mola Mola. Oh, well, Mola Alexandrini, I think is its prop, uh, proper uh, Latin scientific name. Uh, uh, because um, they're very prevalent. Uh, I mean, Bali has a season for the uh, for the sunfish, uh, uh, which usually runs like September, uh, uh, September, October, uh, where they come up into the shallows and then they kind of disappear for the rest of the year. Uh, and we'd already actually received um, data from other scientists that uh, through tagging these, you know, these, these big flappy fish, uh, these mola mola, um, that they are actually always around, but they kind of stay in 100 meters or deeper. Uh, and Alexi, who kind of uh, got into rebreathers as well as a, as a tool to do research on corals at depth in the mesophotic uh, reef range, which is sometimes uh, referred to as the twilight zone. We'd actually had some stunning encounters with these, uh, with, with, uh, with Mola Mola um, in 80 to 100 meters. Uh, uh, so uh, as his training and as his experience then uh, progressed, uh, as he was then getting more comfortable with the rebreather, uh, we started then doing more uh, privately funded um, research uh, on the area. Uh, he has since then uh, developed his own NGO uh, in France. Uh, and uh, 2020, we actually got uh, a, a big grant to actually go and do some uh, proper science 
uh, here off Bali, uh, which has all been in that kind of a depth range, 80 to 120, 130 meters of water. Uh, it's different to the, for want of a better term, the, the normal polar molar. Uh, I mean, I've been to Noosa, Panida, and you know the uh, they're, they're the same ones. They're the, they're the classic ones, right? Uh, uh, but they're actually Mola Alexandrini, so they're they're bump headed uh, uh, sunfish. Right. It's just something you know, on the head. Now, I think they're actually about. Oh, I should know this. Uh, five or six different types of Mola Mola out there. Oh, uh, yeah. right. Uh, and they are also in various parts of the world, uh, in you know various temperatures as well. But yeah, you see one big flappy thing. Everybody calls it a mola mola, uh, but they you know, they, <laughs> they, they 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 do have their their, their little differences. Yeah. yeah so we've been uh, using post circuit rebreather technology now here in research sampling uh, in that mesophotic range, which is. You know, uh, it depends here what manual you look at, but uh, the way Alexi quantifies this is anything sort of like sub 80 meters uh, down to like uh, 130. Uh, we're looking later on in the year, maybe pushing a little bit further than that uh, to, to get uh, some more samples right. uh, on, on water and light um, and some, uh, some environmental um, sampling. So this is all sort of wall diving and, and deep reef. Yeah, it's all wall diving. It's all deep reef. Uh, yeah. So uh, sometimes, we're, well, most of the time we're going by boat. Uh, some of the times we're going by shore. We're using DPVs. We're carrying a lot of gear. He's got a lot of uh, a lot of camera equipment. Uh, we're deploying cameras also at depth, you know, to varying degrees of success. So uh, we found something really interesting. Or oh damn, it's flooded again. Uh, <laughs> it, it's more oh damn, it's flooded again. Uh, yes. Please, uh, to the uh, great great frustration of my uh, my esteemed colleague Alexi. Um, but yes. Uh, so uh, we've been doing that now probably for about the last four years, uh, and okay. it's kind of really uh, increased. Uh, Is it seasonal? It's it's seasonal. Uh, we do it seasonally. We also actually do it when we can schedule it, when we can also uh, get funding for it. Uh, Right. Uh, which has also been a bit of an issue now here with COVID over the last couple of years, uh, with lockdowns and not being able to go yeah. out and things not really being opening uh, opened up. I mean, uh, that October 2020 thing that we had going, that was because we really did actually have um, permits issued from regional government. What sort of... Um... I forgot. God, I've just had a senior moment there, Mark. I, I have them all the time, sir. Oh, no. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. What What sort of other diving are you doing there? Wrecks or cave exploration? or? I'd, I'd like to actually do a little bit more wreck. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, um, you know, uh, the, uh, this part of the world, it goes deep quite quick. Uh, so there are, you know, some unconfirmed reports which we're still chasing up. Uh, I know that you've thing. dived. You've dived on the. Um, oh, what was the the one that the uh, pirates took away? The um, uh, I've uh, uh, dived the Perth, the Houston. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and unfortunately, there, you know, the the, the HMAS Perth uh, out of uh, out of Batavia Bay, out of Jakarta was an absolute stunning dive. Um, I haven't been back in a couple of years because basically friends of mine who, who live in Jakarta and uh, still go out to the site occasionally, they said they, it'll just break your heart. It's it's more or less gone. Um, yeah. Which is so, 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 so sad. Um, and what about the other, the other sort of uh, wrecks out there? You, you've done the, the repulse, the Prince the of repulse. Wales. Repulse and the Prince of Wales also, again, uh, has suffered the same kind of fate, has also been salvaged quite, uh, yeah. quite extensively uh, and has been removed. Uh, there was some fantastic wreck diving here off uh, East Java, out uh, off uh, Surabaya, the first battle of the uh, Java Sea, um, which I unfortunately never got a chance to, to, to dive. Uh, I know Pete Mesley was out there a couple of years ago and they went looking for the wrecks. Uh, and they were all completely gone. 
I mean, everything yeah. was just completely gone. So they've been salvaged. Talking to friends who used to dive the uh, wrecks off Balikpapan, they've also all been gone. We've really had a, a tough time of it uh, as far as our historical wrecks are concerned. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, government interest in um, penalising or unfortunately stopping, not, no. preventing. No, unfortunately not. <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah. Unfortunately not. No, it's... Uh, yeah. So what about caves? You've also done some um, interesting sort of cave exploration, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. We've, uh, we've, uh, we've done a few. Uh, I, uh, I was lucky enough actually to uh, join some former students and uh, what I hope to call friends. Uh, uh, you know, some of our uh, Australian cavers. Uh, it was uh, Ryan and Liz Rogers and a few of the other uh, guys, they came over here wanting to have a look at the caves over in Kupang, uh, Indonesian Timor. Uh, so we went over there in 2014 uh, and had a look at that, um, where we visited some sites that had already been, uh, you know, surveyed uh, and were known dive sites. We also found some uh, new ones uh, where we sort of said to ourselves, we're going to go back one of these days. Uh, because it's, an, it's a nice cast area that we haven't unfortunately gone back uh, with a very good friend of mine uh, Ed Stockdale um, we did some uh, diving uh, around uh, Baobao uh, in South Sulawesi uh, because he'd been working there because uh, he was the diving diving safety uh, diving officer for Oxford and their research station Wow. Uh, and he said, I've got some caves here. Let's go and check this out. Uh, I'd like to do a little bit more there. So we went and did that, I think, also in like 2015. Uh, 2015 to 2016. Also with uh, the plan of going back. Uh, but we then actually did, went out and did some more exploration stuff in 2018, further, further north in Sulawesi which also yielded some really, really, really exciting uh, cave stuff, as well as reef stuff. Uh, but the cave stuff what about, uh, sorry, with the, with the caves, what sort, of, um, what, what sort of depth and what sort of penetration distance? Uh, but penetration, I mean, we, we could have gone on much further, uh, but we were just running out of line uh, on reels. Yeah. Uh, because this was all uh, virgin cave passage uh, nobody right. had ever seen. We were in the kind of a depth range where it was 20 to 30 metres. Um, so we're actually still uh, using side mount equipment, obviously because of logistics in the area um, uh, and air, and we kind of home brewed some 50%. Uh, we weren't wanting to use the, the, the rebreather technology at that time uh, to go in and explore that kind of side of things because it was all uh, really new, but yeah, lots more scope uh, to, to go on. And it's something you can also actually see now here as well. There's a, there's a big focus now uh, with, uh, with cave diving. Uh, also here in, uh, in, in Sulawesi, uh, there's, uh, there's a couple of shops there uh, offering that now. Um, and I think it could actually be the Asian Mexico in a couple of years uh, because yeah. the, there really is a huge variety of caves there uh, and a huge number of caves there. Uh, uh, and I, 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 I'm promising, promising myself to get back. Uh, uh, so as well as all of this exploration, but yeah. what else are you doing? You're teaching in the interim. In the interim, I'm teaching. Yes, exactly. Uh, as soon as we finish here, I've got to go and sort out gas for tomorrow's course. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, but yes, again, uh, you know, as far as the, the, the teaching side of business has been concerned over the last couple of years, it's been tough. Um, we've been able to adapt, uh, especially on the tech side of things, uh, because we've then kind of moved over more into the, rec into the domestic yeah. market. Uh, as uh, the, the Indonesian domestic market kind of matures, uh, you're having more sport divers that want to then sort of uh, venture into technical. Um, also just being servicing gear. And What's play, just play as a matter of interest, what's your view of technical diving? I, I mean, at a personal level, I think it's one of the worst terms that's ever been perpetrated on diving, but... Well, I'm, yeah, I, I'm heavily into, you know, I like the idea of exploration diving or adventure and certainly going beyond the, the norm laid down by many of the um, training organisations. But 
people get captivated by this term technical diving. Uh, well, yeah, we can't actually even call it decompression diving because every dive is a decompression dive. Uh, I, yeah. I, I know that I know there's some people that would argue that point, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, technical diving. I mean, uh, what then probably uh, agree to say here is rebreather diving, um, mixed gas diving, because you are then going to be using a variety yeah. of uh, gas mixtures. I think there's definitely going to be more of an interest, more of a call for it now uh, in a in a post COVID world, um, as I think here. The diving public uh, has also matured. They're, they're more uh, through already being qualified and certified divers. They're also a little bit more risk aware uh, and are then willing to say, yep, yeah, okay, uh, well, I'd like to actually now push my own uh, you know, boundaries. I'd like to push yeah. myself a little bit. I'd like to have more knowledge, more information. I'd like to have more opportunities uh, and, and space, uh, and, or sorry, scope. Uh, to, to continue with the diving. So I think there is going to be this kind of advanced recreational um, market, which is going to continue to grow. Uh, obviously, rebreathers, uh, because of uh, helium prices, they're going to continue to grow as well. Uh, there's going to be continued demand for there uh, as procedures and as equipment and safety yeah. gets better. And then there's the, the move to looking for less expensive gases of course than helium like hydrogen which yes. of course has has its own sort of inherent problems yeah it's, it's not just to blow one. up but... exactly. it's, it's not the best one you want to be mixing up in your garage uh... no no, <laughs> no. <laughs> especially if you're going to add oxygen to it yeah. as well uh... yes it's one of the areas i find absolutely fascinating is that that years ago Diving was driven initially by the military. Then it was driven by the, the commercial diving sector. And in the, in the past few decades, it's certainly been driven by, the, for want of a better term, the recreational um, diver, uh, the advanced recreational diver. The, oh, definitely. The, yeah, the, the amateur as opposed to the military or commercial professional. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the, the military had got the uh, answers, answers it'd been looking for. There was no need to do any kind of more investment in research. Uh, the commercial sector went more ROV. So again, here, you know, uh, research budgets, they also got cut in that sector. Yeah. And it was then kind of le left up to, you know, people who do this kind of thing for fun in, in, in their recreational time. Uh, to go out and push the boundaries, and this is then where we've where we've had some development uh, taking place, definitely within the last ten years. That's for sure. Yeah. And now, what's the um, unseen expedition? Tell me about unseen expeditions. Unseen expeditions is basically the name of uh, uh, Alexi's uh, NGO, uh, right. which is the basically the NGO that runs all of our research. Yeah. Uh, um, that's his, uh, you know, that's his name, uh, because uh, he also feels that you know uh, uh, a lot of stuff we do gets unseen, and we we get to see a lot of stuff that's never been seen before. Uh, so just, very appropriate yeah. title, then, isn't it? Unseen ab 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 expeditions. Ab yeah. ab absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, and what's your so your role is safety. So, uh, everything diving. So I'm a little bit like I'm a mix of uh, mother, Q section, uh, 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 tank stage monkey, uh, uh, Mooley, uh, the person right. sort of like move, moves bits and pieces uh, uh, around, as well as keeping uh, Alexi on the uh, appropriate dive schedule, coming up with a dive schedule, yeah. uh, and doing the the, the risk assessments. Uh, uh, and you know how are we going to get out of this if something goes wrong? That's that's my responsibility. Yeah. How are you? How's Bali placed in terms of uh, facilities, decompression chambers? Very well in that regard. Yeah, uh, actually, very well. We had uh, we had a, a new chamber commissioned a couple of years ago, right just just before uh, COVID, uh, which is a tip top chamber. Logistics here, we get all of our gases. That's really easy. Um, but because there is an established diving community here in Bali, uh, as you then move further afield, 
um, it's it's going to be a little bit more tricky. We're we're yeah. we're heading out to with unseen expeditions in October. Um, it's going to be very very tricky. Uh, we're again here talking about IWR procedures. Uh, if something were were to go wrong, and I suppose that's probably my greatest responsibility is to try and plan and put everything uh, in such yeah. a way that it, that it doesn't go wrong. I think Alex in the Philippines has been doing a lot of work on that. In yes. water recompression yeah. as well. Yes. yes and yeah. the pearl divers in um, Australia. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mark, this has been absolutely fascinating. We're getting to the towards the very end of the um, session now. No, See, I, I told you I told you goes, that would go sort of remarkably quickly, didn't I? It does go actually very, very quickly. Hopefully you haven't yeah. gone too much. No, no, that's been fascinating. And and as I say, it was great to see you again. So oh, lovely thank to see you, you very much. No, and thank you. I'll be in touch shortly anyway. Over the next few days, you'll be okay. hearing from me. Are, are, so, we going, uh, are, are we going parrot hunting in September? I think we should. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think there's a parrot out there with our name on it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the first I think it's that... probably died. It's, it's turned up its little toes and gone but it's the it's the journey itself rather exactly than the, yeah the destination it's, it's all about the journey it always is yeah. now I, I will i will volunteer for the first few rounds of libations <laughs> okay mark thank you once again for so thank you very much coming along much Cushy, i can see that uh, you're there our time is up I'm thank here. You. Yes, the time is up, but I'd like to thank both of you for taking time and joining us today. Um, thank you, David, for moderating such an interesting session. And I really love listening to all your experiences, Mark. And I hope to meet you both physically at the ADEX show happening this September in Singapore. Yeah, looking Look forward, forward to that as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For all our viewers, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them on our Facebook page and we'll try our very best to answer them. Once again, thank you both David and Mark and see you guys soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.